Hello, and welcome to Her Story, a program where we tell the stories of women that have defended this nation, past and present. I'm Phyllis Wilson, the president of the Women in Military Service for America Memorial Foundation and a retired United States Army Chief Warrant Officer 5. Today, we are honored to have United States Army retired Lieutenant General Patricia Horaho with us. She is the first woman to be the Surgeon General of the United States Army, as well as the Commanding General of the United States Army Medical Command. And today, she serves as the Chief Executive Officer of OptumServe. General Horaho, welcome to her story. Thanks, Phyllis. I'm really honored to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So you were born at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You can't get more Army than that, right? <laughs> and your dad was an Army officer. How did your family's history of service impact and make you decide that you wanted to follow suit? You know, growing up at Fort Bragg, it just kind of permeates everything in your life. Um, that community, Fayetteville and Fort Bragg together. And so my dad enlisted in the Army, um, 17 years old, so he could deploy for World War II and then served in Korea and Vietnam and joined special forces when they first started. And so I watched the camaraderie, I watched the families that supported each other and um, just loved what people did for our country. And so my senior year, sitting in the back of the room in a nutrition class, I decided I'm calling the recruiter and I'm gonna join for three years, three years only. And I met the recruiter on the corner of um, Franklin Street in Chapel Hill, right across from Spanky's and um, decided to join. So we have a lot in common here with Fort Bragg. I, I used to jump out of airplanes there, um, but I like Duke. <laughs> so they're, they're okay. okay. They're, That's where our battle lines, right, right, right in the middle of the We're not friends line. anymore, no, I'm kidding. So, so you joined, like me, for just a few years and, and then made a career of it. So you went from joining as a nurse all the way up to being a three-star general and surgeon general of the United States Army. What was that ride like? Talk to us about your career. You know, when I made the decision to join the Army, there weren't a lot of choices for females. They mainly um, were teachers, airline stewardesses, or nurses. And there truly was a height restriction, and I was too short to be a stewardess. And I always say, thank goodness for my shortness, because my life would have gone a totally different direction. And, and so when I joined, um, it was really growing up in a very female-dominated profession, but a male-dominated leadership profession. And the melding of those two um, provided a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges. And at the, when I came in, literally a couple years before in 1978 is when they changed it that if you um, became pregnant, you could stay on active duty and have children. So, I mean, things were really different. Um, when I came in, nurses could not command hospitals only physicians could command. And it wasn't until 1990 where they actually opened that up for all corps. And so the pathway where my career went was nothing um, that I even thought was a possibility when I first came on active duty. So the, you mentioned a little bit about challenges along the way and, and maybe not getting that, that grounding as being a, a you know, more leadership kind of a role than a nurse leader um, early on. And suddenly now you're in a very senior position within the military. So how did you learn to push through those challenges and find perhaps mentors to help coach you through the things that you might not have felt you were fully versed in? I love that you asked that question because I would not be um, sitting here as a retired Surgeon General if it hadn't been for a mentor. And and many mentors along the way, both within the profession of nursing, outside, male and females. And the story that I wanna share with you is one that I didn't find out the rest of the story until many years later. So when I was at Fort Carson, which was my very first assignment, I actually got a call from Branch and, it, and they said, we'd like to send you to Letterman Army Medical Center. And they said, you have 24 hours to think about it. It was Major Freihofer and I said, okay, so like a young lieutenant, I thought about it and I thought, dating a nice guy from Colorado, my brother's stationed there in infantry, my brother-in-law's field artillery. And I called back and I said, ma'am, thank you so much for this offer, but I'd like to stay where I'm at. And it was dead silence on the phone. And she said, you have no future in the Army Nurse Corps. Do not um, put a packet in for conditional voluntary and death. And she slammed the phone down. And I remember walking down to Colonel Journey's office and I said, I think I stepped in it. And she said, why? 
And I told her and she said, okay, dismiss. So I turned in my resignation papers and literally was a 90 day loss. And I was working in the ER on a Sunday and Colonel Journey came through and she said, you know, Lieutenant Dallas, she said, not all doors are closed and she walked by. And I, I remember turning to Susie Rose, who was another lieutenant, and I said, I think I'm supposed to get something out of that. And I thought I applied to stay on and, and then obviously, you know, stayed on um, and uh, went to advanced schooling or recruiting command. And I saw Colonel Journey when I got selected for Surgeon General because I invited her to my um, promotion. And she said, would you like to know the rest of your story? I said, ma'am, I'd love to know what it is. And she said, when you gave me your papers, she said, I put it in my bottom drawer. If I had turned those in, she said, you would have been off of active duty. And I knew that if I could get you to want to stay on because you wanted to stay on, she said, I knew you'd do well. And what it taught me is we have mentors, um, some that are formal, informal, and there are many people that are shaping our career and direction without us even understanding that. And so very grateful for people who invested time. So let's continue pulling that thread a little bit more. There was no roadmap really for you as the, the first woman to become the Surgeon General, the first woman to, to step into commanding general of Army Medical Command, right? <laughs> Dual hatted, as, as we call it in the military, it means you've got two major roles to play and, and of course, none of us are an island. We don't do it alone. What was the roadmap that you would share with other people as they're planning and, and idealizing that maybe someday that could be me? What do they need to do and what kind of people do they need to surround themselves with in order to be successful? I think the roadmap that I would say um, is one, be bold, be hungry, but be humble and, and stay humble throughout the journey. And what I learned early on, and I'll start from Lieutenant and I'll quickly go through, but my very first um, lesson that I learned was I was going down to the supply room and there was a supply sergeant, an E5, and, and I said, I need to go behind there. Can I go behind? And he said, no. And I said, but I need to get tool, um, you know, supplies for my patients. He said, you can't go behind there. And I walked away and I thought, well, that's wrong. So the next day, I went down, same sergeant work in there, and I said, hi, how are you doing, sergeant? I'm going behind there to get my supplies. And he says, have a good day, ma'am. I got them and I left. And what it taught me is if you ask permission, you give your authority that you already have to someone else. So I learned early on to assume that you have a seat at the table and that you belong and that your voice should be heard. And I also learned throughout it is that you have to be comfortable with discomfort. And there is not a job in my entire journey that I ever felt well prepared for it. The Army trains you and you're prepared, right, for a lot of things. But that really, um, every job, it was like drinking through a fire hose the first 60 days in it. And so a lot of learning um, when I got selected as a Surgeon General, I thought it would be the challenge being the first non-physician or first nurse. It was actually being the first female. And it was because I communicated differently, I thought differently, I was leader developed differently. People thought I had agendas because I was very inclusive, I liked diversity, I always said whose voice isn't being heard, let's surround with um, diversity. And I realized that we had 234 years of one type of kind of leader, right? All great in their own right, but it was very different having a female in Israel and um, France actually said, do you wanna know what happened when the United States selected you as a certain general? I said, I would love to. And they said it was a shot that was heard around the world. And it wasn't that I was the first nurse, it was that the United States of America chose a female to serve as a certain general. That really got the conversation going. Wow, that's powerful because on the civilian side, I'm a registered nurse. And I have lots of nurses in my family that, that it, it just makes us so proud to know. I mean, we have leadership skills and, and marginalization sometimes of, or that second class citizen within the medical community. Uh, nurses, as we know, are, are the bedside heroes. And so thank you for everything that you've done and making sure championing that within the military, we're making sure that they're as professionalized as absolutely possible. So what are some of the biggest and best accomplishments? What are you most proud of from your time uh, in the military? I think, uh, one, I'm very proud that not so much of being the first, 
I'm very proud that I wasn't the last. And I think any time you're the first in anything um, is the most important, is that you paved the way for others to follow. And so, you know, I think having the honor to serve as the commander of Walter Reed in the midst of, um, you know, 42 investigations, presidential commission, the Dolce Shalala commission, all the challenges when everything broke with warrior care, to this day, our warriors, all that they sacrificed on the battlefield, the families that gave up so much to support them, but the medical team that came together that really wanted to give their very best to help them to either heal or have the best life that they could. Walter Reed was a defining moment for me. Um, I think the other things that I was extremely proud of as, uh, with the certain general um, role and being able to look as a team of teams was instituting the performance triad of sleep, activity, and nutrition. Um, I'm a firm believer that um, we have to focus on sleep to be able to improve cognitive dom dominance, overall health. And um, it makes a difference in our personal lives, our professional lives. And then moving Army Medicine to readiness training platforms where we really had evidence-based practice at the point of care delivery. And we looked at the readiness of the force and our medical readiness. And then we moved from a disease model of care to a system for health. And every aspect of what we did across Army Medicine completely changed to look at the overall well-being of those that we had the privilege to serve. So I could go on and on because that team was amazing, um, but there's so much that they did that just was innovative, accelerated, and changed the culture. I remember when the app came out on my smartphone yeah. for the performance triad, and, and while we all academically knew that sleep was one of the three cornerstones of being healthy, um, certainly in the military, that's one of those things. How did you work through trying to encourage, especially some of the most senior leaders that seem to function well on three and four hours a night, that, that we all must get, you know, six to eight on a nightly basis yeah. to eight really be... Eight is great, right? <laughs> eight is great. <laughs> eight is great. How did, how did you... Did they hear you? Say, well, it's interesting. So when I first brought it up, and it really came out of being in Afghanistan. So when I got selected as Surgeon General, I remember I went to General Corelli and General Schoomaker, and I said, before I, I take over as a Surgeon General, I, I want to deploy. I want to make sure that I understand what's been going on in the battlefield and how best to support those that have been at war for so long. So they allowed me to deploy. I covered 4,000 miles across Afghanistan, oversaw healthcare across the theater of operation. And I was in a, a small remote outpost and I was looking through um, the prescriptions and there was a stack of them and they were Ambien and Adderall. And I said um, to a young medic, I said, tell me the story. I said, help me understand why you have so much Adderall prescriptions and Ambien. And this is in 2011. So we had been at war, right? Since 2001. And he said, well, ma'am, when they go out on convent, convoys, we give them Adderall. So they're alert. And he said, and when they come back, they're so hypervigilant. He said, we give them Ambien. And I thought, oh my goodness, we have spent all these years and no one weans them off of these practices when they redeploy back to get them healthy. And so that's really collaborative partnerships, collective health is what popped in my mind. And that's where the performance triad was kind of born. And so when I brought this up, all my peers, it was a joke and everybody laughed and sleep, oh yeah. And you know, whenever I'd come down the hall, they'd, they'd say, I only slept four, I'm really trying. You know, and they'd make jokes. And I thought, okay, how do we convey this in a way that they'll understand? And so I spoke at every battalion, brigade, um, commander's course with their command sergeant majors. And one of the things that I said is if you have five or six hours of sleep or less for five days in a row, I said, you have um, a cognitive deficit as if you were 0.08 intoxicated. We never would let a soldier come to work intoxicated. So why are you letting your service members come every day sleep deprived and they're making life and death decisions? And so we talked about it being ammunition for your brain. And then we started changing the whole dialogue. And, and someone said, you'll never change the culture of our army. And I said, just watch us. And, and we did, and by that time I um, was getting ready to leave, the Army allocated funding in the Palm to support this being rolled out across the entire Army. And the way that I said we'd be successful is if it was in the DNA of our Army and they never saw it as a medical. You know, that it's such an important point about sleep and how imperative it is that we not only get it, but we get it properly. 
Absolutely. I used Ambien for years because I was downrange a lot and I couldn't shut my brain off. Um, and there was no program that I could find within the special operations right. community to help me exactly. um, get off from it. So being a nurse myself, a clinician, I knew what it was. It was not beneficial to stick with it, but uh, it took a challenge. And I finally said health wise, I needed to make that a personal point for myself. And it was not easy. No, but, but it's, it was important. It absolutely was. And so I, you know, I have some sleepless nights now. Um, yes. And that just means the next night I'm going to sleep better. And, and you just have to sometimes go through the flow with that, and I think. You do, and you take it day by day. And, it, you know, one of the things that we focused on is we said, for someone who's willing to raise their right hand and, and truly willing to give their life for this country, we owe it to them that the last 10 years of their life is the best 10 years of your life. And so decisions that you make every day really impact those last 10 years. And, and that's why we moved from a disease model of care. We really looked and said, you know, we need to change the conversation of when a disease is gonna occur to if a disease ever occurs. And, and we not only focused on the service member, but we focused on their family, because we realized that if we didn't focus on the family unit, we would never get the service member as healthy as they could be. And it, to me, it, it's something that I think our entire nation needs to be focusing on, every aspect of it. I couldn't agree more. So June 12th, 1948, Long time back, 73 years ago, as a matter of fact, the president, President Harry Truman, signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act, which was the first time that women were actually able, outside of the nursing corps, to stay and make a career of the military. Before that, if they served in wartime only, it was for the duration of the war plus six months and you were out. And so in honor of that, now we have 11 or 12 states, uh, one's pending, um, that have named June 12th as Women Veterans Day. And when you talk about your, your going around and talking with soldiers and their families and so forth, you shared with me a while back that you were visiting, I believe you were down in San Antonio, you were on an elevator and it's what you called a God nudge. And let's talk a little bit about what that was and what we're wearing on our lapels today. I would love Let's to, because this is a passion of mine. I know. So I was down in San Antonio and I was getting on the elevator and obviously there was a military convention that was there and there was an older gentleman who got on the elevator with his wife. And I looked over and I said, oh, what are you doing here? And he said, well, we're having a reunion and he talked about his unit. And something in me said, ask his wife if she served. And I said, did you serve? And she, she just had this expression on her face. And I can't even describe, but it was one where you could tell it touched her heart. And she said, no one ever asked me if I served. And she said, I served in the Air Force. And her face just lit up and beamed. And she got to tell me her story. And I was able to look at her and say, thank you. Thank you so much for serving and wearing the cloth of our nation. And I was able to thank both of them. And I think there are so many women who have served that we never notice or we never get the opportunity to hear their story to say thank you. It really reminds me of my father. And my father fought World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And like many past service members um, who fought past wars, I should say, he'd wear the baseball cap when we'd go out. And he actually was exposed to Agent Orange, so he had Parkinson. And the latter years, 13 years of his life, um, he was in a wheelchair. And when we'd go out, people would either see his hat and they'd say thank you, or they would treat him to a meal. But when they came up and said thank you, he would sit up higher in his wheelchair and I could see the soldier in him. And it was at that moment I thought, the power of a thank you is, is worth so much. And then I would notice that we just don't take that opportunity with our female veterans. And, and it really burned in my heart a way that we could recognize them. So Phyllis, you and I um, had a conversation and I said, it's been about 10 to 15 years where I wanted to create some type of a brooch that people could look at a symbol and say, it starts a conversation, did you serve? And the beautiful brooch that you're wearing is the one that um, we created with out of a conversation of um, what flower should it be? And we talked about the forget-me-not. 
and just the symbolism. And so the purple represents all the services and the V on the, each of the leaves are for the valor of our women service members and what they've done and what they continue to do because they all continue to be leaders. And the pearl is for kind of the purity of their mission. And um, the beauty of the flower is, is really the beauty of each and every service member and their story and their legacy. And I think Anne Han did a beautiful job on creating this, so proud of, of what we're both wearing. We, we're both we're the first two people, as far as we know, to ever pin these things onto our, our uh, clothing. And, and I think it's just a beautiful way of calling out the service of women to their nation. And one other thing that I really think is, is valuable is you know, we've talked before, I, I parked in a parking lot and was called on, you know, that's veteran parking. Not that this is gonna dissuade people from that because many of them won't know, but it is a teaching moment where we can let people know we are women veterans and this is one of the ways that we stand out because to your point, I'm not necessarily the baseball cap kind of gal that says, you know, I served in Iraq or Afghanistan uh, or the t-shirt um, that, there's a pridefulness of every woman that has served and how we choose to display or let people know that we were proud, whether it's a dog tag, lapel pin, or what it may be. But we think that this is one of those, those extra special ways. Um, and, and for the families, too. My, my parents are so incredibly proud uh, that, yes. that they have a daughter that served for, for a career in the military, like you. I was going to do four years, and I was done. Oh, no, no. So... Let's talk a little bit about why you think, is there any value in June 12th being Women's Veterans Day? I mean, we're both veterans. November 11th is important to us. Should there be a special day for us or not? No, if I could start first and, and you recognize Dan Hand, I have to tell you, there is no better designer that I know of um, to have taken on this important mission. And, and then Nancy Popejoy, who helped be the driving force in getting this done and realizing a dream that we both, both had. Um, I think having that day is extremely important. I think taking a time to recognize those that came before us, to give honor to the legacy of women who chose to raise their right, right hand, women who um, really the shoulders were standing on because every generation, right? stands on those that, that have gone before us. And, and I think it's um, when we look at all that we celebrate across this nation, to me, what's more important than taking a moment to recognize women because diversity of thought and ethnicity and gender and experience is the fabric of our nation and women are an important thread that is woven into the tapestry of our nation's story. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes even to join and work here at the Military Women's Memorial, we fought so hard to be thought of as soldiers yes. and not as female soldiers, women soldiers. But, but the more I ponder it, and I guess getting a little bit older, maybe a little bit of wisdom, I'd like to believe. Yeah. Um, I think about, you know, none of us were ever drafted. We all, we were all volunteers. Right. We, all um, we all chose to serve even at times when it was illegal for us to serve, uh, we still found a way mm -hmm. to, to serve this nation because I think that's one of our lines is patriotism does not know a gender. We exactly. love this nation too. And, and I think how we tell that story because women in the military story is very different than our male counterparts. It's not their fault. We're not blaming anybody for the fact that society and the norms of women staying home and, and taking care of children and the household from generations gone by, that is not the standard anymore, but we can't apply today's standard to what happened 100 or 200 years ago, right? But people need to understand that women, even 200 plus years ago, disguised themselves yes, in a did. men's uniform. Yes, they did. I was gonna say the beginning of our birth of our nation, they it's, were disguised and out there fighting. Yes, absolutely. I'd like to pull the thread just a little bit about some of your comments because it really ties to an experience that I had in Afghanistan. And I was the only female general officer out of 48 countries that were there. And so as I traveled around impromptu at night, I would just talk with the female service members of any service that was there. 
And I'll tell you, I got such great insight and stories from them. And many of it is that we had one size fits all behavior health, and it shouldn't be. We had our protective gear was made off of males and it was impacting you know, the way that they could shoot. It was causing lower back pain. We didn't have the, the right um, timeline when women got to make some medication choices prior to deployment. And, and so all of those stories and input we took together and we stood up a women's health task force, Army, Navy, Air Force, and um, stood it up and we changed the policies, we changed logistics, we, we changed um, what got put in the logistics change for females, but it really shows that we can't look through the lens of a single lens. And that diversity is what makes our military strong. It's what makes our nation strong. And women have so many different choices, and I am so happy and so proud that they're choosing to serve in our military. Oh, I know. I, I think when people say, would you advise a young woman today, if she were interested, would you tell her to go for it, to join the military or not? What, what would you say to that? Without a doubt. I, I, I tell, I'll have to tell you, I learned so much about myself. I learned um, a lot of strength that I didn't realize I had. And people pushed me in, in ways that I didn't see the potential myself that someone else did. And I would absolutely encourage any female who wants to come, any woman who wants to come on active duty, even if they serve for three years, you will grow and you will be a different person. It, that's so true because the military pushed me out of my comfort yes. zone <laughs> so many, many times. times. <laughs> and I would have never done some of the things had it been absolutely. not forced upon me. But in hindsight, who it made me become is exactly where I wanted to be. So, so I thank the military certainly for all of that. One of the things we do here, we're sitting in the Hall of Honor at the Military Women's Memorial. We, we're yes. cited yes. at the ceremonial entrance to Arlington National it's Cemetery, humbling. right? It's a pretty awesome location. It's extremely humbling. But the center of the memorial, both physically and metaphorically, is the register, which is our database. So there's three million women that qualify to have their stories forever held in our repository. Mm -hmm. But we have 300,000, so there's 2.7 million left untold here in our database. Can you talk about why you think it's important for every woman, whether it's three years or 33 years, why it's important they share their story of what they know about the military here with us? You know why it's important? When I got selected as a Surgeon General, I had more fathers come up to me and say, I am so happy that you were selected. And I don't think they meant me personally. They meant that it showed their daughter can become anything they want it to be. And, it, and so when you put your name in the registry, you're showing a story to a young girl that doesn't know maybe at that moment in life what they want to do, but your story can actually change the direction of a young, actually I'd say of a young boy or a young girl. And I think stories are what touches a heart. And when you touch a heart, you can take a hand. And when you take a hand, you can change a mind. And when you change a mind, you can accomplish anything. And so I think people putting their name in there, telling their story, there's healing, there's growth, and there's a way for people to say thank you. Well, on that note of saying thank you, allow me to say thank you, Lieutenant General Retired Patricia Horaho for being part of this month's Her Story. Thank you so much. Well, Phyllis, thank you. And thank you for your leadership and all that you do to make a difference in the lives of women you have served and will serve. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.